I'm Dr. Gene Jose, Department of Radiology, University of Miami, Medical Director of the Lennar Foundation Medical Center. We're here to introduce you to the fundamentals of musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging. I'm joined by Louis Payro, ultrasound supervisor for the Lennar Foundation Medical Center, and Nikhil Patel, medical student at the University of Miami School of Medicine that will serve as our patient. Thank you. Hey everyone, this is Richard Wang, one of the radiology residents, and today I'm going to be talking about basic MSK ultrasound evaluation of the hip. First, I'll be going over some MSK ultrasound basics, and then I'll be going over the anatomy and technique for evaluation of the anterior, medial, lateral, and posterior hip, followed by pathology examples, and finally a video demonstration. This is for educational purposes only. I have no financial disclosures. Try to use the terms long axis or short axis when referring to the orientation of tendons, ligaments, muscles, and nerves. Regarding these structures, tendons and ligaments both have an echogenic fibrillar pattern. Muscles are hypochoic with echogenic septations. Nerves have a fasciculated honeycomb appearance. These are the three main transducers used in MSK ultrasound. The left two are high frequency linear transducers and the right is a low frequency curvilinear transducer. For evaluation of the hip, you want to use the low-frequency curvilinear transducer for the deeper structures. The middle high-frequency linear transducer can be used for the superficial structures. Regarding anisotropy, make sure to place the probe perpendicular to the tendon or ligament to avoid artifact which can mimic a tear. The bottom right image is an example of anisotropy at the supraspinatus tendon of the shoulder. When evaluating the anterior hip, place the patient supine. Use the femoral head as a landmark to evaluate the joint recess that is denoted by the arrows. More superiorly, at the white arrowhead, you can see the anterior labrum of the acetabulum. It should look like a homogeneous hyperechoic triangle. More superficially, you can see the iliopsoas muscle. If you follow this posterior immediately, you can find the iliopsoas tendon. For evaluation of the TFL and the sartorius, you want to place the transducer in short axis at the anterior superior iliac spine. In the top right image, you can see the TFL muscle on the lateral side, denoted by the void arrowheads, and the sartorius muscle on the medial side, denoted by the void arrows. When evaluating the rectus femoris, the transducer should be over the anterior inferior iliac spine to look at the direct tendinous attachment. On the bottom right image, you can see the hypoechoic region denoted by the void arrows. This is the indirect tendon with anisotropy artifact joining the direct tendon. For evaluation of the medial hip, have the patient lie supine in frog leg position. Look at the insertion of the iliopsoas tendon at the lesser trochanter, then move on to the muscle bellies of the adductor muscles. The three layers from superficial to deep are the adductor longus, adductor brevis, and adductor magnus. Note that the gracilis muscle is in the same superficial layer as the adductor longus, but the gracilis muscle is more medial. So follow the muscle bellies to the pubis to evaluate the tendinous insertions. For the lateral hip, lay the patient on their side. Use the tensor fascia lata as a landmark. Move the probe down to the greater trochanter. The gluteus minimus tendon is at the anterior facet of the greater trochanter. The gluteus medius is at the lateral facet and just superficial to the posterior facet is the greater trochanteric bursa. It is usually not filled with fluid in normal conditions. At the posterior hip, we'll be examining the hamstrings and the sciatic nerve. Lay the patient flat on their belly, find the ischial tuberosity, which will be the main landmark. It is the attachment of the hamstring muscles. Lateral to this, you can find the sciatic nerve emerging from under the piriformis. If you shift the probe more inferiorly, you can start to distinguish between the conjoined tendon of the semitendinosus and biceps femoris and the tendon of the semimembranosus. Here on the left image, we have a long axis view of the proximal femur with fluid in the anterior joint recess. On the right image, this is the contralateral hip, which is normal with no effusion. 
These are long axis views of the femoral neck. The left image shows an anechoic cleft, which is denoted by the white arrow at the hyperechoic fiber cartilage labrum, indicating a tear. The curved arrow shows a small joint effusion. The right image shows detachment denoted by the white arrow of the labrum denoted by the arrowheads. Here we have some fluid between the posterior facet of the greater trochanter and the gluteus maximus muscle. This is suggestive of greater trochanteric bursitis. Ultrasound images of the lateral facet of the greater trochanter show thick and hypoechoic gluteus medius tendon with loss of the normal fibrillar pattern consistent with a gluteus medius tendinosus. This is a long axis view of the adductor longus tendon with tendinosus and interstitial tears. The arrowheads show normal distal adductor tendon. Here on the left image, this shows a long axis view of the direct head of the rectus femoris with cortical avulsion at the open arrow from the anterior inferior iliac spine. The right image shows a full thickness tear of the rectus femoris denoted by the arrows that is retracted from the origin denoted by the curved arrow. This is an example of iliopsoas bursitis. The red arrows show fluid within the iliopsoas bursa, while the blue arrow shows the iliopsoas tendon. This is an example of tendinosis and partial thickness tear at the hamstring origin. You can see thickening of the tendon and a discrete anechoic focus shown by the red arrows. We're going to do an evaluation of the hip, um, specifically intraarticular. So for this, we like to use, because it's a deeper structure, we like to use the, the convex. The 5C1 is uh, the probe of choice. Um, so we're going to start off uh, long axis, right on the uh, femoral head, okay? Uh, long axis, so we can see anatomy we're looking for. We're looking for uh, labral pathology, we're looking for effusion, looking for synovitis. Uh, we check the, uh, the joint, long axis, and again, short axis. While we're there, I like to then go a little bit more medial, go to the iliopsoas muscle and tendon, short axis, and also in long axis. In order to interrogate the lateral aspect of the hip and the gluteal tendon insertions, we place the patient on a uh, side position with the affected hip pointing up. The transducer is linear, either 18, 10, or often linear 5. The transducer is placed along the greater trochanter and long axis. In this position, we're going to see the iliotibial band and the gluteal tendon insertions, and we're going to evaluate for iliotibial band thickening, gluteal tendon pathology, and greater trochanteric bursitis. We will interrogate these structures both in long axis and in short axis from below the level of the greater troch and scanning uh, approximately towards the patient's head to above the level of the greater troch. Lastly, we're going to move the transducer in short axis posteriorly to, eva posteriorly to evaluate the sciatic nerve and any evidence of sciatic pathology. The third and last part of the hip evaluation is examination of the hamstring tendon origins. To this, we place the patient prone, uh, covering the patient's uh, private parts with a towel. A linear 18 or 10 megahertz transducer is used. It's placed in a transverse dimension along the ischial tuberosity. At that level, we will see the hamstring tendon origins. We will scan inferiorly towards the patient's feet, interrogating the hamstring tendon origins both in short axis, and then we will turn the transducer to evaluate it in long axis as well. We will take note of any ischial gluteal bursitis. We will also follow the sciatic nerve, which will travel lateral to the common extensor tendons and make sure that there is no concomitant pathology.